Our dear Heavenly Father, in the midst of this beautiful place, we come into this sanctuary. Sunshine outside, beautiful, heating up the cool air. And so, Lord, in this place, we claim your presence, and we praise you for your presence here. May our time together, may the word spoken, may every note sung, may every word that comes out of Pastor Gray's mouth be blessed and be guided by your spirit. In thy name, amen. Romans 8, 38 and 39, it says, For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.
Titus 2, 11 through 14. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that, denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. Continuing on in Titus chapter 3, verses 4 to 7, says, But when the kindness and the love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us, through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, that having been justified by his grace, we should become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Our last song together as a congregation is called What Grace is Mine. And uh, if you don't recognize it, you will. It is uh, sung to the tune of Danny Boy.
right, we have a special story lined up today, and we're going to need some space. So if you're sitting right here, if you can move more over there, because our storytellers are going to be coming straight down the aisle, and we do not want you to get bumped over. All right. I Right there, sweetie. Happy Sabbath, little lambs. We have a special story this morning, and I want you to be sure you knew what we're talking about. Can you see that sign over there? And I'm going to ask our two to come right here to meet our, no, 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 the two, two helpers are right there, and our two conductors are coming right here. Yes. They are battling the wind with our sign. What does our sign say? Heaven. Raise your hand if you are looking forward to going to heaven. I am. If I could raise both hands, I would. One of my favorite thoughts about going to heaven is that God is going to give me a crown of life. How many of you want to wear a crown? All right. Okay, so let me see how quiet you can listen. Be very, very quiet. Okay. You just... Right here, these people, they're, on, they're heaven bound. And they're on the train because they want to go to heaven and see Jesus. All right? But there are some people we are about to learn who also want to join the train. Let's see. Let's see who they are. All aboard, all aboard to heaven. Welcome. Oh, I'm so sorry. I was just delivering all these groceries to people in need, so I thought I was going to be late. Oh, no, no. Welcome. You're just in time. Just in time. Uh, all we'll need from you is your ticket. Oh, perfect. Perfect. Um, I know I have that because earlier I was giving my last few dollars to a homeless man. So I know it's in there. I saw it. Wow, that's great. Okay. All right. Oh, here's the train. Uh, wait a minute. All these people. What is Jim Crime doing there? How did he make it? <sighs> I am not going to sit there. I don't even care if this place is taking us to heaven. I'm not going. All aboard, all aboard to heaven. Oh, here comes some. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Welcome, welcome. Oh, thank you. Oh, driver, please sit back there. Yes, thank you. <gasps> welcome. So glad you're here. Thank you. Yeah, well, all we'll need is your ticket. Oh, of course, darling. Here it is. Now, do please be careful with my bags. So many expensive things you just can't even imagine. Actually, I might just take care of that. Thank you. Uh, well, that's great, but we just need your ticket. You can't take anything else with you. What? Do you, do you know who I am? The financial support that I have given to the church, the people that I've helped, not to mention the amount of money I've given in tithe, and to say that I can't take my stuff. We'd love for you to come. I mean, you've got your ticket, but it's just you and your ticket. Oh, I never. Driver, get my bag. <laughs> All aboard. Last call for heaven. Oh, it looks like we got some. Oh, wow. Welcome, welcome. We're so glad you all are here. Uh, all we'll need is your tickets. We don't need tickets. All we have is Jesus. He lives in our hearts. <laughs> that is so good. Welcome aboard because that's all you need. Let's go. So boys and girls, how many of you have Jesus in your heart? 
Yes. So when we talk about grace, when we talk about going to heaven, Jesus already paid the price for you to be heaven bound. The only thing you have to remember is to talk to Jesus, listen to him, and obey. Is that easy enough? Because Jesus loves us all, and let's love him in return. All aboard, all aboard to heaven. Let's bow our heads. Thank you, Lord, so very much for our little lambs. Help them to understand, Lord, that you are just wanting them. You have already made the way. You've already paid the price. And I pray that they will look forward to being with you one day when you come. And you will just place a wonderful crown of life upon their heads. May they not trade heaven for anything. But may we all, Lord, make a decision to follow you. In Jesus' name, amen. You may return to your seats. Morning, y'all. Happy Sabbath. So uh, I'm doing the offering call today, um, and I'll be totally honest with you. The offering today is going to fund uh, a really nice pair of Isotoner gloves and a Carhartt jacket for Pastor Gray, so he can remember exactly how chilly it was last night. Um, no, I'm just kidding. He actually brought his gloves, I saw, so um, he's prepared. But... Um, no, today's loose offering goes to help um, support and fund uh, gatherings like this. I mean, if you look around, it's beautiful, and, you know, it doesn't, it, it's not free, and um, it's just an awesome opportunity for our church to be able to um, bring so many people together, a great speaker, and um, tasty food. Um, so obviously that costs money, but... Um, you know, God says he loves a cheerful giver, so um, I hope everyone is generous, um, and it looks like my distinguished deacons are all ready. I didn't choose you, but I would have chosen you, so if you guys want to go ahead and stand, we'll have prayer. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for this beautiful Sabbath day. We thank you for um, everybody that's here. Um, and Lord, I just pray today that uh, we all have a generous spirit. Um, as we uh, search for uh, any loose uh, dollar bills um, that we can put in cowboy hats today, um, Lord, I just pray that you be with us in the rest of this weekend uh, today and uh, keep us warm and keep our spirits filled with your love. We love you so much. Amen. Uh, we'd like to introduce and welcome our uh, music Am I on? No, I need to go to uh, like to introduce and welcome our musical group uh, for today. They'll be with us all day. They're going to do a couple special musics now and then um, have a full concert at 2:30, so be sure to join us for that. This is Master's Voice. <laughs> I've been a lot of places And I've seen so many, many faces Yet there's still times that I feel all alone But in my lowly hour Oh, that precious, lowly hour 
Jesus tells me again I am his own forward to spending the day with you. I, uh, before we hear from the preacher, I want Jerry to come sing this song. You know, tomorrow morning, if I wake up and I find that my family's gone, if my church burns to the ground, if my friends forsake me, if my bank account is empty, if everything I've ever held precious in this world was gone, he would still be better to me than I deserve. You listen. I'd rather have Jesus than silver or gold. I'd rather be his than have riches untold. I'd rather have Jesus than houses or land I'd rather be led by his nails guard hand than to be the
God is so good. And, uh, if you were here Thursday and Friday, the teacher taught us, Pastor Gray taught us, that there is a difference between mercy and grace. He taught us, for those of you who weren't here, mercy is that thing, that I deserve something bad and it doesn't happen. That's mercy. Grace is that thing when don't deserve something good, and the good thing happens anyway. And the grace is why we're here. Praise God. He gives us so many things. Now, I was asked to, to, to do prayer, but I don't do prayer. I lead prayer. This is your prayer time, folks. The prayers that you, each one of you, will offer up to God are much more important than any prayer I can give up here. And I'm going to give each one of you an opportunity, just a silent time where each one of you offers up your silent prayers, and you're welcome to offer your prayers instead of mine and along with mine. We do have a very uh, frightening situation that's happening in the Stecker household. Uh, Rita Stecker's son has been in a very serious accident. And uh, we need to uh, lift Steve up in prayer during this very, very difficult time for that family. Let's bow before our Lord as we pray. Almighty God, Master of the universe, the one who would be unapproachable except that you've asked us to approach you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that you care about each one of us, that you care about our prayers. You've asked us to bring our, our special requests and our praises to you, and you've promised to hear. Oh, Lord, thank you for that. Thank you for all the mighty ways that you've worked on our behalf. And yet, we've gone astray, Lord. We've, we've gone our own way. We've done things that we should not have. And 
this world's in trouble. A lot of bad stuff happening, and Satan's accusing you, Lord, of all the bad things that happen. And so many times we're tempted to believe Satan. Help us, Lord. Help us that we will stand firm. We will not believe what Satan is telling us. We will not believe that lie that has come down through the ages. Help us, Lord, to be faithful to you. There's, there's things that we bring before you, Steve, and I'm sure, and, and, and the accident that he's been through and the struggle that he's going through for life. And we ask, Lord, that there's so many other struggles that people are going through, crisis, death, relationship things, jobs. Oh, Lord, you know what each one of us is going through and which, what each one of us is facing. And we ask, Lord, that you would answer those prayers in a way that not just, well, sometimes you answer the prayers and what's best and not necessarily in the way we think you should. And help us, Lord, to love you and trust you even if our prayers are not according to my will. Let our prayers be according to your will. And I invite each person here to send their prayers up to you, Lord, and I'll be silent. And Lord, thank you, thank you, thank you that you hear and heard each prayer. Lord, help us, help us all to be faithful to you and accept that grace that you have so freely provided. Help us, Lord, that the next camp meeting would be that <laughs> glorious camp meeting that we'll have with you in glory, in that land where there will, no, will there will not be any suffering, no pain, no sorrow, no reason for tears, all the tears you'll wipe away personally from our faces. Lord, let that day come soon. Let us be ready and help us to bring those we know and love with us. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs> I have the privilege this morning of introducing our speaker, Pastor Keith Gray. It's been a long time since I've known Keith, but I knew him in a way that reveals a man's character. My father-in-law was an ace quarterback, and he would surround himself with young guns to play the game and Keith Gray was on the same football team with me back in the day. And I want to give you a glimpse of what it looked like to be in that huddle. My quarterback father-in-law would tell me to go stand out wide there by all-star Keith. And the instructions given to me were really simple. Tim, just go up 10 steps, turn around, and hold your hands up like you're going to get the ball. Can you do that? Okay. <laughs> but to all-star Keith Gray, it sounded a little bit more like this. Keith, red right, 22 Texas, <laughs> split 693, zebra flat, and end it with a Y post. Got it? Okay, everybody on two, break. Here we go into that football play and sure enough Keith would beat the coverage that ball would sail over 
far enough to where nobody else could get it but speedy wide receiver Keith. And that play would often end up as a touchdown. Yeah, I saw Keith where you discover character. And what I saw in that football field, even back in those days while he was still wearing cleats, was grace. Grace on the football field. Playing with all your heart, but just having fun with the brothers. Yeah, there were watchers back in those times. I'd be bringing along my little kids, as a lot of us would do. And they would see how we'd react out there on that football field. And such was the ministry of Keith Gray at that time that it caught the hearts of my children. My daughter told me, Keith, that your ministry, while she was there at Southwestern, meant so much. He turned in his cleats to join Team Jesus. And since then, he's been catching passes for the greatest quarterback. And now he has turned in that wide receiver position for something far more important, and that's showing us what real grace is like. And Pastor Keith, we are so happy to have you here with us today. The message is Thursday night and Friday night. We're incredible. And I know that this morning... God has something else incredibly special for all of us on this Sabbath day. Pastor Gray, we're praying that the Holy Spirit fills you and will fill us, that we take the wonderful message of grace to our community. Come on up, Pastor Keith. going to have to remember to bring a little bit of extra cash for all the introductions to the speakers. He was describing me and I kept looking around to see who it was he was talking about. Those are great memories. Those were a few years and a few pounds ago, Lord have mercy. You know, life has a way of making football a spectator sport. I thank you for your generous perspectives. I, I could hear the preacher in you getting ready to turn the corner, and I was about to turn it loose and let you go ahead and preach. <laughs> Happy Sabbath, everyone. Praise God for what a wonderful camp meeting this is. I was saying last night, and some of you weren't here, y'all must really love Jesus. To be out here with that wind blowing off and all of the wonderful, and stay, and you got your stuff together, Lord have mercy. I dare say that you love Jesus more than folks in Texas, because we would have been inside. (laughs) So thankful for the kind way that it is you've treated me while I've been here. Folks felt sorry for me and people were, I'm going to get you clothes and I got a sweater underneath and I got gloves and all kinds of things because people were worried about, about the pastor. I, I, I want to let you know I'm all right. I'm all right. Because no matter what happens, when I'm in this pulpit, I have on a robe of righteousness that cuts through anything that I might have to deal with. Amen. Today, I'm going to talk a little bit about grace. We've had a wonderful time, and I like to teach a little bit before I go into the message. Here's something that's a little tidbit about grace that you need to understand. We've learned that grace requires the grace in us requires a return on investment. What God puts into you, he's looking for a return on. 
We found out the difference between grace and mercy that's already been shared with you. We, today, I want you to understand that grace comes with a command. God's grace is his pure, unadulterated power that none of us deserve, and it goes beyond salvation. It goes to who it is you're going to become in him. And it works like this. Anytime God gives a command, the grace of God is there to help you fulfill the command. I'm going to show you how that works. I know we haven't gotten into the message yet, and I haven't even had prayer, and, and I'm definitely going to do that with you, but I, I got to show you how God's grace actually works in attachment with his commands. God only commands that which it's impossible for you to do without his command. That's why... In scripture, when you look over at your wife or you look over at your husband, God has different commands for you in marriage. He says to husbands, love your wives. I thought I'd get an amen from at least one man. Y'all still trying to figure that thing out, ain't you? But he says to wives, respect your husband. Oh, now the brother's going to show up. <laughs> See how that goes. See, but what I find interesting is that he doesn't, he doesn't command the husbands to respect the wife. And he doesn't command the wives to love their husbands. I thought for sure I was going to hear a woman say, Amen. <laughs> but here's the reason why. It's not that God doesn't want respect for women and it's not that God doesn't want love for men it's that he created us that that is our natural response it's a natural response for women to love those that they have so he doesn't have to commend it respect amen lights so he commands it. It's the man's natural response to respect. That's what we do. That's how we communicate with one another. It's a matter of showing respect. If you ask a man if he could have love or respect, you know what he'll tell you 99.9% .9 of the time? You ain't got to love me, but I need you to respect me. How many of your fathers told you the same thing? So he doesn't command respect because it's natural. He commands that which needs God's help. Are you understanding? Even shows up in creation with the command. When God said, let there be light, he was making an impossible command. Y'all don't believe me. Any biblical scholars here can tell me when God created the sun, the moon, and the stars. What day? What day? Day four. What day did he command light? Day one. So he commanded light when there was no light source for three more days. He commands that which is impossible to be done, to be done, and it will be done because God's grace is so powerful that when he says it, it happens, even if it's impossible. That, my brothers and sisters, is God's grace. And that is why when he comes to Exodus 20 and he says, keep my commandments, and he says, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. He's not telling you what it is, is in your power to do. He's commanding something that he knows only by his grace you can do. That makes sense? 
Mm -hmm. Now, today, several years ago, God gave me a sermon that has, for me, been the epitome of God's grace. And one of the first times that I ever preached it was right here in this state, not too far down the road at a wonderful place called Ozark Adventist Academy. It was years and years ago. I think I was still catching touchdowns back then. God gave me a special way of dealing with God's apex move of God's grace. And it's in a different package. So if you've been with me all week, you know you're going to have to put on your sanctified imagination as I carry you through this story. It's a story you've heard before over and over again, but I gotta teach it in a way that maybe you haven't heard it so that you listen all the way through. Is that all right with you? Amen. Please turn with me in your Bibles to the scripture of that story. Luke chapter 23. Luke chapter 23. I'm going to start with verse 39 and following. And the Bible says this. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence? We are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus answered him, truly I tell you today, you will be with me in paradise. The title of my message is a curious title. You'll figure it out as the, as the sermon goes along. How does that song go again? How does that song go again? Let's seek the Lord in prayer. Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. Today I am weak, but you said you would be perfect in my weakness. Be perfect today, O oh Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. Amen. Most of the times when we hear this story, we are drawn to where we ought to be drawn, and that's the center of Calvary, the cross of Jesus. But I found out something, that the cross of Christ is best amplified in the lives of those around the cross. So today, I want to tell the story of the cross through the eyes of someone close by. In my sanctified imagination, he started off as a little boy, maybe at an Arkansas camp meeting like this one. He would come up for children's story. He learned all of the things that you're supposed to learn his favorite part of the worship service was the music. He loved all of the songs. He loved the songs about Father Abraham having many sons. He, he, he loved the songs about no, no, never, never, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, no way, I'll never turn back anymore. But there was a song that was his absolute favorite. Even from when he was little, there was this song that would draw him, it would draw emotions out of him that he could not completely understand. It was his all-time favorite. At night, he would go to bed 
singing that song. Anytime he was discouraged or anxious or afraid, that song would draw him close and allow him to sleep in peace. Time marched on, and the little boy became a teenager. He began to question the authorities that have always been with him. You know, when you're a teenager, your favorite question is, why? Or, how come? And if you're not careful, those can kind of get you in trouble. Because sometimes we as adults don't like to hear the question, why, come out of our children's mouth. Amen, lights. It sounds too much like a challenge. And we answer questions, why, with, because I said so. But you, you're not so far removed that you don't remember that streak of stubbornness that would well up in you and how you bowed out your chest and decided that you were a man long before you were a man. You remember those days when you felt like you were a man even though your mama was still doing your laundry. And he began to buck up against the rules and authority. He got tired of going to Sabbath school. He got tired of being drugged to church. He, he got tired of hearing all the same preachers come and say the same thing. He found himself sleeping on the back row and finding other things to do with his time. In the middle of the night, he would sneak out of his room and go and have fun in town. Come back smelling like beer. He remembers those days when he would start digging into his mother's purse, stealing money so that he could buy alcohol. Finally, the day happened when mom was cleaning out his messy room and found all of his nudie magazines and all of his beer bottles underneath the bed. And father finally had to get involved, said, look, if you're going to live in my house, you're going to have to abide by, ah, oh, your father was like that too. He bowed his chest up and said, I'm not going to live in your house no more. If it's got to be that way, I'm grown and I'll live on my own. Where are you going to go, boy? You lost your job at Taco Bell. You can't mow a lawn straight enough to get hired on. Where will you go? And he said that thing that he genuinely believed in his heart. He said, my friends will take care of me. And off he went, left. The last thing he remembered is seeing a tear in his mother's eye as he went out to go live with friends. How many of you know that doesn't work out very well, does it? No. No. Because friends are friends as long as they ain't got to feed you and that they ain't got to do your laundry for you. Slowly but surely, he found himself walking into another life. And in order to eat, in order to live, he was hanging around a group of people that he couldn't call friend anymore. They were just associates. They taught him how to steal they taught him how to do all the things that went against everything that he grew up learning. And before you knew it, he had been out of church so long that he couldn't remember any of the memory verses that he used to know. For long, he couldn't remember the songs that he used to sing, the no, no, never, never uh, uh, uh. He, he couldn't remember 
who fathers Abraham's sons were. But there was this one song that he could remember just a little bit of the words to. It was that song that would comfort him in the middle of the night. It was that song that brought him joy. And he could not remember the rest of it. He could just remember the first part. And on days when he was particularly discouraged, when he was missing home but too proud to go back and life wasn't turning out the way he wanted, what would comfort him in the middle of the night would be that song. It went something like, amazing grace, how sweet the sound that, that, how does the rest of that song go? He found himself falling asleep trying to remember the rest of the song. Time went on, and one day he was walking by a crowd of people. If you're a thief, the only reason why you're in the crowd is because where there are people, there are folks that you can steal from. But they were all gathered in close. They were listening, not to one of the priests that he knew growing up. They were listening to some backwoods preacher from Nazareth. And as this man preached, our friend began to go through the crowd looking for somebody to rob from, and he got caught up listening when he should have been robbing. I want to let you know something. I don't care what it is that brings you in an encounter with Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ will use whatever encounter he has to in order to get to you. He found himself listening because this preacher said ridiculous stuff that he had never heard before. This preacher said, blessed are the poor. He had never heard of anybody called poor people blessed before. He began listening and and he began hearing, blessed are you when men shall revile you and persecute you. He knew all about that life. And as he listened, as Jesus spoke, he could almost hear the tune of the song that was always in the back of his mind. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that... that how does that song go again? After the message, he had no need to steal because Jesus fed everybody in the place. 5,000 plus were filled to the brim and there were leftovers after everybody got what they wanted. There with a belly full and a heart full, he began to say to himself, if God is really like this, maybe there's some things that I missed from the Bible stories at home. He found a priest that was on the outskirts of the assembly and he rolled up to him and said, who is this man? He preaches like he, he knows God. I could get with a God like this. The priest looked at him. The priest looked at him like he was a tear. Those of you who have been here, you know what I'm talking about. Those of you who are Johnny-come-latelys, you better ask somebody. Priest looked at him like a tear, looked him up and down and said, that man is a charlatan. He is a con artist. And if you get anything out of what he says, you must be just like him. 
priest had no idea that that statement was the greatest compliment one man could ever pay another. And he got the insult all right. Most of the time when we're pointing out terrorist behavior, people are not lost on the insults that we mean. Drew him further and further in. Now he was in the core. He was in the center of the gang that he ran with. And he was learning how to hurt people in order to get what it is he wanted. He was learning twisted theology. He was learning stuff that was going to get him in trouble. He was further away from the song than he had ever been. And on that day, when the robbery went wrong and the Roman soldiers caught him, he was with the guy who killed a Roman soldier. Rome does not play. Rome does not debate. He was thrown in the jail under the jail, quickly sentenced to die. You know, life changes when you're on death row. I remember one day substitute teaching in a public school. I have no idea to this day why it was on the wall. But on the wall in this classroom where I was teaching was a list of all the men Texas had executed that year. Next to their names was their last meal and their last statement before they were executed. And do you know what I did not see? Young people, listen to me carefully. There was nobody who was hardcore on death row. I didn't hear anybody yelling out, yeah, boy. I didn't hear anybody talking about, this is for my homie. When he got to the last lines of life, when they recorded the last message, here are the things that you hear when life is on the line. Mama, help me. Daddy, I'm sorry. Lord, have mercy. And there, in his death row cabin, recognizing that on tomorrow, his life was going to be cut short and that he would never see his mother or father again. Trying to still the stuff that's going on in his stomach. This was not what it is he had in mind. This was not the way life was supposed to end up. He tried his best to remember all of the songs because when you believe you are facing God in the morning, it's funny how much you want to remember songs like Father Abraham had many sons. How does that song go? He began, amazing grace, how sweet the sound that that no matter how hard he tried, he couldn't remember how that song went. But it drew him enough to drop to his knees and begin crying out, God, I know I don't deserve to have you answer this prayer. But God, if you were ever really there, just be with me. Prison door opens and another prisoner is thrown in. This man barely has the strength to even sit up. As he's laying there in the cell, in the darkness, he can look and see that this third prisoner 
has been beaten within an inch of his life with a whip called a cat of nine tails. A whip that literally would shred your back into strips. He had been beaten from his shoulders all the way to the backs of his knees and his flesh hung. Every time his heart pumped blood, you could see it pulsate through the strips of open flesh. Barely able to move. He looked and saw that this man, all of them were going to die, but this man, he looked and saw that this man, as he turned his face to the side, he looked and saw that not only was this man sentenced to die, this man was supposed to be completely humiliated on his way to death. He looked carefully, and where there should have been a proud beard on the face of a Jew, they wanted to embarrass him, so they took their fingers wrapped it in his beard and yanked it out by the roots. Again, wondering about this third prisoner. He asked the same question that all of us ask. You know, you can't help but ask. What'd you do? It starts when you're a kid, back when you're in trouble and you're at the principal's office and there's two or three of you sitting on the bench waiting to go see the principal. And you're singing songs like, nobody knows trouble I'm in. And you're from your class and they're from their class and all of y'all have got to go and face the same principal, but you got to ask the question, don't you? So, what are you in for? You know, it's the, same, it's the same emotion that you have when you're blocking traffic on the highway because you saw somebody get pulled over. Now, you know you don't know anybody in that car. But there's something about it that you got to slow down and look. Somebody's going to be late for work today. Why do we do that? Because you just got to know. You, you, you just got to know there's this part of us. It's the same thing that my wife does to me. It's bad, but we got to know. Where my wife will go in, pull out the milk and say, look, I think this milk is spoiled. Taste it. No, it's all right. No, no, I don't. I, it may have a good day left in it. Well, then taste it yourself. No, I could get sick. What is it about us that is drawn to it? It's the same reason why we slow down at an accident. You know you don't know anybody in there. Stop rubbernecking traffic. You were angry before you could see the accident. Please, let's go. I got to get to the airport. But when you get up there, you can't help but go, ooh. So distracted from his own issues, he begins to ask the question. Hey, dude. What did you do? We're here for murder. What's your crime? There is silence from the third prisoner. I get it. You've had a rough day. As the darkness begins to clear up, he begins to notice another thing on this third prisoner. This prisoner already has a crown. It's not a diadem of gold. It is a crown of thorns. I've been to Israel and I've seen the thorns. They can grow to be about this long. Or longer and they are stone hard 
in order to wrap that into a crown, you've got to use utensils or you'll tear your hands up. And in order to make the crown stick, you would put it on the top of his head, take a stick and beat it down so that it would dig in to his flesh so that all he could see was the blood beginning to pour from his head. This third prisoner was really going through it. Couldn't help but ask. Next day, crucifixion day, each one of them was given their cross to carry. I always wondered where my mother got that from. I told you I lived back in the days when getting a spanking meant that you grew up to be a good citizen in the United States of America. Only got a few amens this time. But if I was acting up at church, mom had this, this, this tradition that she was not going to wait until you got home. She would take me out of church and point me in the direction of the nearest tree and tell me, me, to go get her a switch from off the tree. Now, I know I'm not alone here. Is there anybody who remembers those days? I got a few. I got a few witnesses there. A few good citizens here in the United States. But I never could understand, why couldn't she go get her own switch? She'd send me. And there you are picking, and don't come back with something that's flimsy. And don't come back with something that, 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 no, I need to get the right, I had to figure out which was the right one. It had to make the right ring as you ran it through the air. And then she'd make me carry it back to her. That's where I learned the song, Down the Via Dolorosa. <laughs> and I found out she got it from the Romans. <laughs> they would make you carry the wood for your own cross. Now here's there's some subjection. There are theologians that believe some things and theologians that believe others. Here's where I am. When we get to heaven, we can ask Jesus for ourselves. But I believe that they didn't try and make you carry the full cross. That nobody is carrying that. It's too heavy. Especially after a night where you've been beaten all night long. What they do to you is make you carry your crossbar. That's the big wooden plank that your arms would hang from. Now here is where we get an understanding of a few things. Have you ever noticed that in scripture and in paintings, whenever the crucifixion is depicted, the thieves have ropes and Jesus has got nails. I always thought that was just unfair. Why? Well, the ropes were there for a particular purpose. The ropes were there to make sure that when they gave you this crossbar, you couldn't use it as a weapon. Because if you're about to kill me and you're going to give me a two four, you know what I'm going to do with it, right? Uh-huh. Who's going to be first? I may go down today, but I ain't going alone. So they take your arms, wrap them around, and tie your arms to them so that all you could do was carry the weight. Listen to me. They got to our friend and they wrapped the arms around the wood and tied it. They got to his friend and they wrapped his arms around the wood and tied it. When they got to Jesus, he had been so beaten and lacerated and he was in so much shock that when they tied his arms to the wood, he could not hold up his own weight. So when the Bible says that he fell, 
I need you to understand your brain sends out a message to your hands when you're falling down and the brain says, hands, I need you to protect the face. The face is more important than you are. Come out and protect the face from the fall. But if your hands are tied to the wood, when you fall to your face, you literally fall on your face. They tried two or three times to help put that cross on him, but he kept falling and kept falling until they realized he might die before he ever gets to Calvary. Do you know the only reason why he could get up? It was God's grace. I will drink this cup to the very dread. See him with all the power that heaven could muster. Push himself up. The weight of the bar is not what made him fall. It is the weight that he carried of your sins and my sins and every sin that has been committed since Adam all the way to the end of the road. He carried it by God's grace. Now we need some help. Ain't no way he's going to carry that. So Simon shows up. I don't know what a black man from northern Africa is doing in Jerusalem at Passover. But he is absolutely the wrong complexion in the wrong place. Because when they look at the Jews, even Jesus' disciples don't want to touch him. They're there, but they're not going to pick up that cross. Why? Because the blood might contaminate me, and I won't be able to go into Passover. So they look for somebody who didn't have that issue. And there Simon is. Poor brother from another mother. And say, hey, you, Simon said, who, who, me? Need you to come carry this cross. Oh, no, my brother, you don't understand. I'm just here because the crowd is here. I'm getting ready to go home. Matter of fact, yeah, I think that's my wife calling me right now. Until they pulled out that sword. And I can hear Simon say, hold up now. Can't we all just get along? Now Simon is carrying the cross as Jesus walks behind him and this sorry procession walks through the middle. Here's our friend crying, weeping as the jeers come. He doesn't even realize that nobody really cares about whether or not he's in the procession. All the attention is on that prisoner that came in late last night all of the attention is on the one man in the middle. And as they walk through this sorry, sad performance, he says nothing as they spit at him, as they jeer at him. Finally, he begins to ask again, Hey, why don't you tell us what's your crime? Why is everybody hating on you so much? Not a mumbling word. They move on their way to Calvary. See him as he stops the procession. Even on his way to Calvary, Jesus can stop a procession in his tracks. See him as he turns to the women who are weeping and says, My sisters, don't cry for me. Cry for yourselves and for your children. If they do this to the green tree, what will happen when it's all dried up? Our young friend is like, what in the world is he talking about? Finally, they get up Golgotha's hill. He listens as Jesus turns to Simon and thanks him for carrying his cross. 
So this is how you die in crucifixion. The ropes are there, not because there are no nails. Nails are a part of the fun. The nails don't kill you, though. If you're going to die on a cross, you die because the Romans had perfected death. They had perfected pain and death. The nails were carefully placed, not here in the middle of your palm. Why? Because there's no way that the meat in the middle of your palm could sustain the weight of your body for as long as you needed to be there. It would rip right through your hand. So they'd put it here at the base of your hand. And they strategically would look for that nerve that is connected to the one you used to call the funny bone. You remember the funny bone? Ever hit your elbow here and you feel that thing that kind of goes all the way up through here? That nerve that is so sensitive, they put the nail right through it so that you would experience immediately excruciating pain. Matter of fact, the word excruciating actually means out of the cross. Why were the ropes there? The ropes were there because now we needed to hold your hand still you're going to nail my hand to this stick. You better believe I'm going to be moving my hand. I believe that's where breakdancing was invented. People are like, no. So they'd tie your hand in place, and they just got so tired that they'd leave the ropes, and they'd nail it in into the wood as you screamed out in pain, knowing that the next hand was next and knowing that the special treat was what they do with your feet. Again here, theologians have differences in the way that they see it. Some like it on one on top of the other. What I've understood is that their favorite way would to have your legs twisted this way so that your arms are abnormally stretched and they nail your feet heel to heel into the side so that you're already twisted. My 55-year-old back says, like, hey, 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 don't preach that like you used to. And I've got no nails. I've got nothing there. But this is how you would die. You would die because... Your body is hanging in such a way that all you can do is breathe in. You, you, can't, you, you can't exhale. In order to get the air out, you'd have to push up on the nails in your hands and feet so that you could breathe. And then, as long as you could stand the pain, as long as you could hold your body up, you could breathe, but then you'd sink back down. And the carbon dioxide would begin to build up in your lungs so that every time you exhaled, there was less carbon dioxide going out and more of it staying in your body until it would begin to poison your blood. You could stay on that cross for days. Slowly but surely, your life inching. When they got to Jesus, the one in the middle, the reasons why there were no ropes 
is because he held his hands in place. Never moving. As they nailed that nail into that nerve, Desire of Ages says, he mumbled not one word. Young people, you want to be hardcore? Be like Jesus. The only way you would know he was in pain was the sweat that began to pour from his forehead that was mingling already with the dried up blood from the crown of thorns. That's it. And he hung there. Our thieves were moving up and down on that rough wood. But can you imagine what it was like for Jesus and our young friend that is over to Jesus' right-hand side. He's looking as Jesus pushes up and speaks to heaven and for the first time opens his mouth and says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Oh, I can't take it no more. I can't take it no more. How are you going to forgive them? They're killing you. And not to mention they're killing you, they're killing me too. What's up with you, man? Don't you know we're dying here? When his friend came in, yeah, they say you a Messiah or something. Well, I'm in between churches right now. If you can come down off this cross, take me with you. He's hearing all the jeers that are coming from the priests and the rulers, all the ones who got on him for his terrorist behavior. He hears them crying out, if this be the Son of God, because you know that's how all Pharisees talk. Come on, you've heard you every time you've ever watched a cartoon with the Pharisee, all of their voices sound the same. If this man is truly who he says, come down off the cross. It's like no Pharisee's voice ever drops at puberty. Come down off the cross. Now we'll believe you. Suddenly, the little boy, as he looks over, just trying to remember something that would bring him comfort, he remembered the song. And as he remembered what he could remember of the song, suddenly he recognized where he had seen this man before. You got to excuse him for not remembering earlier. He had been beaten till he could barely be recognized, but there on Calvary saying, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He recognized the voice. This is a voice that would say things like, blessed are the poor in spirit. This is a voice that said things like, blessed are you when men shall revile you and persecute you and say all manner of evil against you. You're that dude. You're that God that I heard all those years back. You're that one that was preaching. How does a man who claims to know God get into a position like this you must be the worst criminal you gotta be after all if God is good you'd better believe God wouldn't be in a situation like this hanging out with people like us I demand to know tell me what is your crime what did you do before I die I must know, what did you do? Jesus said not one word. All right, if you won't tell me, some of the people that are down below, see, not everybody was jeering at Jesus' cross. There were a few people who were looking at him. It was the dark 
is of the world. Look, and he saw a young man there crying and weeping at Jesus' cross. He said, hey, do you know this man? So said, yes, I know him. What kind of a criminal is he? Man said, criminal. He's not a criminal. He opens the ears of the deaf and opens the mouths of the dumb. That's no criminal. That man is the best surgeon God has ever produced. He looked at somebody else and said, hey, hey, do you know this man? Yes, I, 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 I know this man. What kind of a criminal is he? What crime has he committed? I don't know about any crime. All I know is that I was lost and he found me and brought me back to my father. That man is God's GPS system for mankind. He looked and found somebody else. Hey, lady, why are you weeping for this man? What kind of criminal is he? That man is no criminal. I was guilty as charged. I had been thrown before everyone, and they had rocks to stone me. And he told them, drop your rocks. I am Alpha and Omega. I alone have the right to judge. He said, go and sin no more. I don't know about criminal, but he sure is a criminal attorney. He's the best lawyer that the world has ever seen. See him as now the testimony series at the cross is beginning to pick up steam. Somebody else came walking and saying, hey, he takes lame limbs and makes lame folk run. Somebody else got up and said, that's nothing. I was sick. I had leprosy. And he said, I want to heal you. And he healed me. That's nothing. Lazarus steps up, says, I was dead. D-E-D. -E the A had already disintegrated. I was D-E-D -E dead. And he walked by my tomb, opened up my tomb, and called me by name. And the only reason why he called me by name is if he had just said, come forth, there's so much grace inside of him that every person who had ever hit death from Adam all the way to now would have come out saying, were you calling me? But he called me, and the way he said my name was so profound that I could hear it even after I was dead. Suddenly, suddenly, as he looks back at the man, Jesus looks over and without a word, says, you want to know my crime? My crime is that I love you too much to let you die here by yourself. I have come in answer to your prayer. God is with you. Suddenly, in the back of his mind, he could remember the rest of the story. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that, that before he could get it out of his mouth, the dumb and the deaf began to sing it. Amazing grace, how sweet. The sound. The woman caught in adultery, she began to pick up the refrain and said, That saved a wretch like me. Prodigal son came in from the feast and said, I, 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 I
was was long but now I'm found Bartimaeus had been waiting this whole time because this was his line I, I was blind but now I see Suddenly his temperament changed as the jeers were coming from the other side of the cross. Our friend looked over and said, would you just shut up? Stop it. Don't you understand? This man is innocent. You and I deserve to be here. We're the wretches that they're singing about, but this man has done nothing wrong. Jesus, oh, Jesus, all I ask is that you remember me. See, my mother and father have forsaken me, and I'm here by myself, and it would do me well if I knew that you would just remember me when you come into your kingdom. By now, death has stepped forward and is reaching out for Jesus. But Jesus hears one more prayer from one more wretch and the sound goes into the ear and to the brain and says, we can't die yet. There's one more that's left that can benefit from his life before they benefit from his death. And the brain said, oh, well, we need to give an all call. See, as the brain sends waves down to the arms and the feet and saying, you can't give up just yet. We're tired. We're stretched. It's time to close our eyes. Death is here. We have completed everything. No, no. As long as there's one sinner that's left that can hear the word of God, we've got work to do. Legs push. Arms push. Lungs take in one more breath of air. See Jesus as he raises up on that back that has got splinters stuck in it. He raises up, takes a full breath of air. The lungs that said, let there be light, and there was light turned around to cast light on souls that were in the darkness. See him as he says to death, um, death, you're going to need to wait a little while. It's not my time yet. See, no man takes my life. I lay it down when I'm good and ready. I'm plenty good, but I'm not quite ready. See him as he looks over at the young man and he says to him, Verily, verily, I say to you, today. See, we get caught up. As Adventists, we get caught up with it today. We're like, well, today, does that mean that they were going to be in paradise? You know the answer to that question. The comma. It's not in the Greek text at all. There are no commas in the Greek text. They just creatively have taken the comma and put it where they chose to put it. But that's not what he's saying. It's not the paradise that comes today. It is the word, the promise comes today. At every funeral that you attend, it's not the paradise that comes today. It is the promise that comes today. And the promise is, today I say to you, I don't need to remember you. I've known you since you were a gleam in your father's eye. I know you and you will be with me in paradise. Well, that feels good to me. That feels good to me. I came all this way, folks. 
Y'all got to let me finish this sermon. I know you're ready. But I got to finish the sermon. Can I have somebody who will let me finish the sermon? Can I get somebody who will give me five minutes? Five, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30? That's that holy math. Hallelujah for Jesus. I can see the, the thief on the cross say, it's good to know that you're with me, God, but I don't understand something. If you're God, what's good with having a dead Jesus? This is the part that requires your sanctified imagination. I believe Jesus said, dead? Bro, you don't know the story. I'm not going to stay dead. I just got some things that I need to get. That's what you're talking about. See, when Satan got kicked out of heaven, he reached into my pocket and he stole my keys. Keys? What keys? He stole my keys to death, hell, and the grave. I've been asking him throughout the ceaseless ages, when are you giving back my keys? He hasn't responded. I emailed him, no response. Called him, no response. I texted him, I even sent a message in his DMs and he has not responded. So I came to get you and to get my keys. Well, how are you gonna get the keys from here? Oh, I got a plan, I got a plan. See, I know Satan very well. They're going to take me down off this cross in a couple of hours, and they're going to put me in a tomb. Death is going to wrap me up in clothing and put me in a tomb. And sure, as Sunday morning comes, Satan's going to come in and try and gloat. He's going to come in, look over my chest, and says, I beat you. I beat you. I won. I won. And as soon as he gets close enough, early on Sunday morning, I'm going to open my eyes and say, boo. Did you miss me? I'm back. Oh, I get it. Then you're going to break out of the tomb. No, 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 I ain't going to be breaking out the tomb. I ain't doing all of that. Well, how are you going to get out? The rock is sealed. How are you going to get out? Well, you see, it's about royalty. Royalty? Yes. See, when I come out of that tomb, I am no longer the prince of peace. I am king of kings and lord of lords. Well, well, what does that have to do if you're king of kings and lord of lords? Surely you can open up the tomb. Yes. But you see, when you're a king, you don't go around opening doors for yourself. I got a special angel, a special angel who's been planning all the way back from Daniel's day to deal with that. He's a specially prepared angel. See, when Lucifer got kicked out, he was directing the heavenly choir. Lucifer got kicked out on the upbeat. Gabriel slid in on the downbeat and has not missed a beat since. <laughs> oh, Gabriel's been waiting a long time. He's a big bad angel with big wings. Gabriel doesn't wear sandals. Gabriel wears Nike sneakers. Y'all didn't know Nike was in the Bible. It means the victorious one. Hallelujah for Jesus. Woo! Gabriel's there, and, and, and when that morning comes, Gabriel is going to put on them Nikes and stand at the gates of heaven saying, I'm ready to go. I'm ready to go. And God's going to have to hold him back. Calm down, fella. You need to be there at dawn. As fast as you fly. Remember the last you flew so fast that Daniel didn't get a chance to finish his prayer before you landed. Y'all check me out. Fact check me if you want to. Daniel will let you know when he finished his prayer about the, the prophecy, Gabriel was already standing there. So you'll move too fast. I need to give you a little bit of time. Ten. Nine. Eight. Can I go now? Wait, boy. 
seven, six, five. I don't want to run into any traffic around Jupiter. Calm down, fella. We've cleared out the lanes. Four, three, two, one. See Gabriel start to run down Hallelujah Boulevard. See Gabriel as he gets to the gates of pearls. He's built up such a head of steam. The angels are having a hard time opening the gates before Gabriel can get out. No problem. Opens up those big wings up over the tops of the gates of pearls. See him as he brings those wings in to keep against wind resistance. Flying, flying faster than the speed of light. See him as he comes down. Down, through Orion's belt. Oh, see him as he hits the Milky Way galaxy. Oh, see him as he's racing the sun to come up. See him as he hits through, bounces off Saturn's rings and does a dip through the asteroid belt and hits the ionosphere and starts to put on brakes as he gets to the atmosphere. By the time he hits planet Earth, the Earth shakes rattles and rolls underneath his feet. See him as all of the, the soldiers behold this big bad angel as he walks over to the tomb, picks up the rock, spins it on his finger like Kobe Bryant, dribbles it between his legs and says, Jesus, son of the living God, your daddy's calling. Then I come out with all power in my hands. On my way out, I will look at the sniveling devil in the corner, grab him by the throat, cast him down, and say, my keys, please. And when I have those keys, I will fulfill what I told Adam. My foot will rest on his head. And I will say, oh, death, how you like me now. Oh, grave, where is your sting? Every knee shall bow. Every tongue shall confess that I am that I am. And in my keys, I have the grace enough to open up whatever it is you find yourself locked behind. I have the grace to fix a marriage that you broke. I've got the grace to stimulate your brain cells and turn a dropout into a PhD. I have the grace to turn around your financial fortunes. I have the grace to return the affections of father to child and child to father. I've got the grace to heal cancer. I've got grace enough within me not only to calm your storm, but to allow you, hallelujah, to be able to walk successfully in the midst of your storm. I've got that grace. Like the thief on the cross, I know that you still have the imprint of your Father in heaven. I know that how broken you might be, you still are good seed. Heads are bowed, your eyes are closed. This is that time. Somebody here has been trying all of their lives to remember the song. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. Saved a wretch like me. I once was lost. Never forget it. I once was lost. You need to remember that grace bestowed. I once was lost, and now I'm found. I was blind, but 
now I see. Under the sound of my voice, Lord, there is somebody who has been hanging from a cross of their own making. Don't know how long they've been away and they, they've been worried about coming and they feel uncomfortable. They have people looking at them as if they have terrishness on them. But yet, Lord, they're still here because somewhere in the midst of my messed up preaching, somewhere in the midst, they can hear you calling to them. I have come that they might have life and have life more abundant. Dear God, would you give it to us? I know it's late, and I, and I know some of you are going to feel really uncomfortable about this, but I can't help it. I've got to give an appeal. I don't need any music. The song is enough. If God has spoken to your heart this day and you recognize that there is enough power of grace to turn things around for you. I don't know what your situation is. Maybe, like the thief, you are needing to come to him for salvation. This is your time. This is, I want to pray this prayer for you. I don't know what your situation is. Maybe you already have been clinging to God's salvation, but you believe in God's grace for salvation, but God's grace never seems to get out of the parking lot after church, and you have not applied God's grace in your everyday work-a-day, walk-a-day, study-a-day life. And now you recognize that the keys to hell, death, and the grave are more than just salvation. It impacts my daily life. I don't know what your reason is. Maybe you are looking for a way to empower your ministry to others because you recognize that there are souls in need of the grace that God has given to you. Wherever you are, if God's grace is what it is you need more of, I wonder if you'd stand to your feet while I pray this prayer over us. God of heaven, God of mercy, God of grace. Thank you for Calvary. Thank you for bearing our cross, our whips, our shame, our nails, our beatings, our humiliation. Thank you for exchanging our crown for yours. Today, Lord, we feel the power of God, the same power Paul talks about that raised you from the dead is the power that you place in us to impact the world around us. Father, we bow our heads filled with your power and mercy. No pride here. We walk humbly with our God, dear God. Today, bring grace alive. It's always been there, waiting for my faith to activate the power of God in my life. Oh God, today, whatever it is, whatever it is we need your grace to touch, whatever it is we need you to create in our lives or recreate in our lives, do it this day, God. And we promise to give you the glory and the honor. We promise to live out the glory and the honor in whatsoever way you see fit. We ask it 
in his name. Amen. Amen. You sing that song quietly to yourselves. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saves a wretch like me. I once was lost. Hey, before we uh, before we break for lunch, let's sing another old one. See if y'all know this one right here.